Hi everyone, this is Dr. Karens, and in this lecture, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the digestive system. All right, so um, in terms of overall functions, what is what are we trying to do with the digestive system? And let's think about it. We're eating food, right? And we're breaking that food down, and it's going to get absorbed into our blood. Well, what, what is the whole point of that? Our cells need the food. They need specific chemical nutrients in the form of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and fats in order to do all of the metabolic activities that they need to do. They need those nutrients for energy. So digestion is how we are able to provide ourselves with those nutrients. First, we're taking in the food, we're breaking the big pieces of food down into small pieces, and then going even further and breaking down the chemicals into the nutrient molecules, the, the, the specific carbohydrate that our cells can use for energy. What is that carbohydrate? You know it. We'll talk about it in metabolism. Um, we need to be able to absorb those molecules into the blood so it can, the, they can get to the cells. And then we need to get rid of anything that we can't digest. So what are the organs involved in this? So we've got two groups of organs. The first is this alimentary canal or the GI tract or the gastrointestinal tract. And this is basically one long tube open at both ends. The, the organs that are part of this GI tract are in the pathway of food. So food is passing through these organs. So we're talking about what? The mouth. The pharynx, which is the throat, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine. And then I guess the anus is separate. I kind of figured that's part of the large intestine. They're all connected. They are all connected, actually. But this is, you know, food is going in one way, and then whatever can't get digested is coming out the other end. But there are other organs involved in this process, too. They're just not necessarily part of the of the pathway of food and these are the digestive organs so your teeth and your tongue are technically they're part of your mouth so yes you could say food does pass through these um, organs you don't necessarily this is interesting you don't well I guess you kind of do you kind of need your mouth and tongue um, your teeth and your tongue if you're gonna be able to chew and swallow um, if you don't have those, there's other ways to get that food into the digestive tract. Um, the other accessory organs, though, the food does not pass through them, but you need them to provide other things to allow that, that all those digestive processes to occur. And so these organs, we're talking about the gallbladder, the liver, the pancreas, and then your salivary glands up here in the, the mouth area, they are all contributing to digestion, but th those specific accessory organs, not part of the pathway of food. All right, so as you are learning the different organs of the digestive system, particularly of the GI tract, I want you to think about which of these six digestive processes occur in each of those organs because then it it is going to help you remember and understand some of the complexities of the organ um, so what are these processes ingestion which is eating propulsion which is the the movement of food progressively through the GI tract so that is going to involve swallowing your your propelling that food forward, and then something called peristalsis. So that is, again, moving that food forward through the organs of the GI tract. But then we also need mechanical breakdown. So this is where you are taking large pieces of food and breaking them down into smaller pieces. So chewing is part of this. Um, any, any type of churning in any organ, like the stomach, for example, that would be part of mechanical breakdown. And then segmentation is a another type of movement, but it's like a back and forth movement 
Um, you see that a lot in the small intestine. It's, you know, the food is going to be propelled through that small intestine, but while it's doing that, it's taking these little back and forth movements to help mix that food with digestive juices and things like that. So that's mechanical breakdown, but we're, we're not done there with the breakdown because the, the molecules that our cells can use are pretty simple molecules. So even after that big mechanical breakdown, we still need to further break down this food, but now we're doing it chemically versus physically or mechanically. And that's what we mean by digestion. So the, the term digestion really is, in if you want to be specific about it, it, is really talking about chemical digestion. So that involves enzymes. What enzymes are breaking down what type of molecule in order to get that type of molecule down to the nutrient form of that molecule? So you're going to find in these different organs, they, some of these organs produce enzymes and they will produce enzymes that can digest carbohydrates or proteins or lipids or nucleic acids. So that's another thing to keep track of when you're learning about these organs not only what processes occur in each organ, but if what type of chemical digestion, if it occurs in that organ, what type of chemical digestion is happening? Meaning, are we chemically digesting carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, or all of them? And what are the enzymes that are going to be doing that? And then absorption, another dige digestive process. This is how the those nutrient molecules are leaving the GI tract and getting into the blood so that they can be passed on to our cells. And then finally, defecation. That is how you get rid of whatever is undigestible. Okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about the anatomy of the GI tract or the alimentary canal. So you're going to see this a lot more in lab, but again, the structure is going to dictate function. So basically all of the organs of this GI tract make up this one long tube and the tube consists of four main layers or tunics. The first is the mucosa. So this is lining the lumen or the space in the middle of this tube and the lumen is where the food is going to be. Um, there's going to be um, enzymes coming in here from this layer, hormones, some um, absorption is going to be happening within this layer as well. The three sub layers of the mucosa, there's an epithelial lining, of course, then there's a lamina propria, which is some connective tissue here that's going to provide some capillaries. And then there's this muscularis mucosa. That's the most superficial layer of the mucosa. Um, it's smooth muscle. It's going to help move just the mucosal layer. It does not contribute a whole lot to that propulsion of food down the GI tract. That is the job of another layer. So superficial to the mucosa is the submucosa. This is connective tissue, and that's where we're going to find nerves and blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. Superficial to that is the muscularis externa. This is the muscle layer that is going to be responsible for both segmentation and for peristalsis. There are two layers of muscle tissue within, this is smooth muscle, there's two layers of muscle tissue within the muscularis mucosae. Uh, sorry, muscularis externa. Um, the first of these is the circular layer, and the it's called that because the um, the muscle fibers are running kind of um, perpendicular to the tube, or they're they're like forming the perimeter of the tube. They're running in that direction, and then just outside of that is the um, longitudinal layer, and in this layer of the muscularis externa the muscle fibers are running parallel to the tube. And so having muscle layers that are running perpendicular to one another is going to allow uh, maximum types of movement. It just allows for more movement. And then finally, the, the most superficial layer is the serosa made of the visceral peritoneum, which again, that peritoneum 
is um, that that connective tissue layer that helps anchor these organs to the rest of the body. When you're in the esophagus, the serosa is called the adventitia because it's a little more fibrous. It needs to be a little more tough because the, the esophagus is subject to um, a lot more friction than some of the other um, GI tract organs. Um, all right, uh, control. Just general um, overview of how the digestive system is controlled. The GI tract actually have it has its own nervous system called the enteric nervous system, sometimes called the gut brain. Um, the neurons within this system talk to one another extensively. This is how the GI tract is going to be um, controlled in terms of motility. So. You know, we need to be able to tell it different parts of that GI tract, okay, start pushing this this food through or no, hold on to it. Um, it's the if we're talking about nervous system control, it's going to be these enteric neurons that are going to be um, doing that communication. Short reflexes are taking place within the gastrointestinal wall. And these reflexes, this think of a reflex arc, you have a stimulus a sensory neuron, maybe an interneuron, a motor neuron, and then an effector. The effectors of the GI tract or of digestion in, in general, it, it's going to be your smooth muscle of that muscularis externa, or it's going to be a gland secreting something that's helping with digestion. Um, the stimuli, if there, I guess you can think about short reflexes and long reflexes of this enteric nervous system in terms of where the stimuli are coming from, that the stimuli are coming internally, coming from inside the GI tract, meaning food is passing through that GI tract, which is stretching the walls of the GI tract, for example, where the chemical composition of the food is being monitored. And so pH might be changing because of that food. Other chemicals are changing because of the presence of food. That's what we mean by an internal stimulus. So that is going to talk to, using these enteric um, neurons, talk to the smooth muscle and glands of that GI tract. But sometimes there can be stimuli that's coming from outside the gastrointestinal wall. And if that is true, then we're talking about a long reflex. So this is like you know, you see some food, you smell some food, and all of a sudden you start feeling hungry or you feel your stomach start rumbling. These external stimuli are communicating with your central nervous system, which is then communicating with your gut brain and getting that ready for food that's about to come. Um, and some other concepts. So one of, one of these I just, well, we kind of already talked about this, right? Um, the basic um, concepts of digestion regulation, that your digestive activity is stimulated by a bunch of different types of mechanical and chemical stimuli because of the food. Food is stretching the GI tract. That's what we call by mechanical. And then the chemical composition of the food itself is being monitored and can trigger either turn on or turn off um, digestive processes. The effectors, I already mentioned, smooth muscle and glands, and then um, neuronal control. We know already we were talking about those intrinsic and extrinsic controls, but also hormones can control digestive activity as well. And the hormones are often coming from the GI organs themselves to either tell the food to continue on or maybe tell the food to hold off a little bit because we don't want to overwhelm different organs of the GI tract with too much food at one time. Okay, so that's kind of the end of the overall work um, overview. So again, just to reiterate, when you are going through these different organs, I want you to think about and maybe even write down which of those six digestive processes are happening in that organ. There may be more than one. And then as we're going to see a little bit later, um, we know that chemical digestion has to occur in order for you to absorb these nutrients. And that chemical digestion is happening due to enzymes. So as you're learning about these different organs, make a note. 
If any of these organs are producing any enzymes, what are those enzymes? And what nutrients are they digesting? Are they digesting carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, or nucleic acids? 